and best of all, Beachbody coach promoting Team Marley. Wherever her travels take her, please help me welcome Marley Matlin. is about how 
I'm able to stand here today and share my success story of overcoming obstacles with you. You know, far from the tragic life that some might expect from a girl growing up deaf, growing up in the Matlin family in the suburbs of Chicago in the 1970s was like one long episode of The Brady Bunch. <laughs> it's true. Because for me, every day on Rosanna Avenue in Morton Grove, Illinois, was a sunshine day. And no matter what barriers came my way, my parents taught me that it was all about keep on, keep on, keep on grooving, <laughs> just like they sang on the show. With my hearing aids firmly planted in my ear, and with the air of the most popular girl attitude that my parents encouraged in me, I believed myself as Marsha Brady, who just happened to be deaf, with long, luxurious hair, skating down the street, saying hi to everyone, whether they knew me or not. <laughs> but it's funny, times have changed. And though today, as you heard, I'm an actress and film producer, as well as an advocate for children's charities and disability-related causes, and the lady with the P90X shirt on Celebrity Apprentice, who raised one million dollars for deaf kids. <laughs> I'm also a mom of four. I'm also a cook, carpool driver, conflict mediator, closet organizer, and pretend math wits. <laughs> so though I might have set my sights very high at 11 years old, creating myself, manifesting in myself, the beautiful Marsha Brady, who just happened to be deaf, I have to face the fact that I am now living another reality. I am now Alice the maid. <laughs> Goodbye, Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. <laughs> but seriously, life is good. It's been 24 years since critics said that I won my Academy Award out of pity and that I would never work in Hollywood again simply because I was deaf. And I'm still here. <laughs> The barriers that many predicted would stop my career dead in my tracks have been simply ones that I have walked around. Even better, attitudes towards deaf and disabled individuals have changed for the better. And with the advent of technology, things like closed captioning and instant messaging and video phones and Twitter, barriers are virtually gone. So now, most of the barriers I face are more humorous than they are distressing. Here's a couple of examples. Once, when I was working on a television show with Mark Harmon, an executive from the studio came to watch me work on a scene with Mark, just to watch us work together. And after a few minutes, the studio guy said to the executive producer of the show, he said, you know what? That Marley Matlin, she's great. Is she going to be dead for the whole show? <laughs> while I was getting ready to appear live on TV, on CNN, in front of, million of millions of viewers, and the, I was just sitting there for an interview, and the director was counting down the seconds, five, four, three, two, and Jack was sitting with the interviewer there, and as they counted down, the woman leaned over, who was going to interview, and said to Jack, could you tell Marley we have something in common? My dog is deaf, just like her. <laughs> And the red light comes on, and I'm thinking, okay, what am I supposed to do? Does she want to throw me a bone? Does she want me to bark? I mean, what? I'm a speechless. She want me to do woof? I don't know. I'm just kidding. Anyway, what's that? Good interpreter, isn't he? She said, oh, I missed that. She got it. They got it. And you know what? This kind of stuff doesn't always happen in Hollywood. Because here's a good example. Here's something that happens to me several times. I'm getting ready to take off on a plane and at a magazine, and the flight attendant hands me the menu. 
And I'm signing with Jack here. She sees me signing, grabs a menu out of my hand, comes back a few moments later, and brings me a new menu in Braille. Oh. <laughs> it's happened three times. <laughs> Even when I tell the attendant I'm deaf, not blind, a few of them have to think for a moment. Then they go, oh, oh, and then I never see them for the rest of the flight. <laughs> You know, I use these stories not to trivialize the barriers facing people like myself. Because though, as I said, attitudes are changing, there are still hundreds of thousands of people who are out there who are deaf or differently able, who are misunderstood by the general public or just simply shut out. Whether it's being there as an actor, as an advocate, on behalf of children's causes, or just showing off some of my P90X moves on Celebrity Apprentice. The message that I strive to pass along is that important lesson that I got from my parents about living a life generously, and one which applies here today. All of us, despite what abilities we possess, have the ability to achieve. As my friend Henry Wiffler put it so aptly, if you will it, it is not a dream. My parents first found out about my deafness when I was 18 months old. And whatever the cause was, at the time, there was no cure. After one and a half years of hearing and even speaking, I was diagnosed as profoundly deaf. And in my mother's mind, there were no such thing as deaf children. As she said, she had no idea what she and my dad could do. They were devastated. My parents sought the advice of several specialist doctors. Several of them suggested that I should be sent to a school for the deaf hundreds of miles away. And my parents did that. They visited a number of schools. They were all great, great institutions, all over the Midwest. But at the end of every visit, they asked the same question, the same one. Who would put Marley to sleep each night and say, I love you? And the doctors, they had no answers. So, rather than send me to a school hundreds of miles away, they decided to keep me at home and send me to schools right in the neighborhood. Every day, they opened the door and they encouraged me to explore. They allowed me to be independent and let me meet new kids on my own. And yes, I was different. And oftentimes, kids in the neighborhood cruel, could be cruel. But to my parents, that was all a part of growing up, deaf or not. Some call it determination. Some call it guts. But us Jews have another word for it. Good spot. <laughs> This idea that I could do anything, despite what barriers were out there, were traits that I got from my parents. But it was my mother who helped me discover my love for acting. Because she saw acting as the perfect outlet for her deaf daughter, who loved to sit with a Judy Blue book in her hand, devouring every single word, or who would like to sit in front of the bathroom mirror, performing stories with magical characters who, not surprisingly, signed back. <laughs> because in my world of books and magical mirrors, there were no barriers, and all my dreams could come true. Eventually, my mother found a more productive outlet for me, and that was a small community theater that served both hearing and deaf children, right near our house. And by the time I was 12, I had become a pro. I had done songs and stories in sign language all throughout the area. And one day at the center, I found out that Henry Winkler, who was also known as the Fonz, and who was the most famous person in America, even more famous than President Carter at the time, <laughs> was paying a visit. And I insisted on meeting him. So after my performance, I went right up to him, and I said, hi, I'm Marley, and I want to be a famous actor in Hollywood just like you. You know, my bags were practically packed. I was really <laughs> But, just as Henry was about to speak, my mother 
took Henry aside and told him, though it was good to encourage Martin, it might be a good idea not to encourage me too much. And you know, I think about it. As my mother, as a mother, I know exactly what she was trying to do. She was trying to protect me. Because in her mind, the reality was that nobody in Hollywood would ever give me a chance. There was so much about appearances. No one would ever, ever give me the opportunity to succeed. What my mother didn't know was that Henry Winkler had his own barriers growing up. Because as a young boy, Henry had difficulty reading in school, and his teachers told him that he was stupid and that he would never amount to anything. And it wasn't until many years later that Henry found out that he was dyslexic. So, despite the dire predictions, Henry persevered, and he fought for himself, and eventually he chose a path to success, acting. And in the end, Henry Winkler went on to achieve greatness beyond anyone's wildest dreams. So, there was Henry, listening to my mother, in his polite Henry Winkler way. And after he was done, Henry turned around, knelt down, looked me straight in the eye, and said, Mar like, the, like the Fonz, Marley, sweetheart, you can be whatever you want to be. Just believe in yourself and follow your heart. You do that, Marley, and your dreams will come true. And nine years later, I found myself standing on the stage with an Academy Award in my hand. So, there, I've conquered barriers, you say. I've reached the pinnacle of success with the Oscar. But, as all of us know, one should never get too confident, too content with reaching the plateau. Because in my case, it happened the very next morning. Right there in the morning paper was an article by a columnist named Rex Reed that said my victory the night before was the result of a pity vote, as I said earlier. And then he asked his readers to consider whether my performance was the best, as he said, because I was just a deaf person in a deaf role. So how is that acting? I was devastated. And it was as if all my mother's fears about my future in Hollywood were coming true. And I have to say, for the first time in my life, I truly felt handicapped. I was ready to give up. And I almost would have given up everything and said goodbye to Hollywood had it not been for one very important person, Henry Winkler, once again. Because Henry kept in touch with me over the years. He encouraged me. He checked in with me. He was essentially my coach, sending me notes, inviting me to visit Hollywood if I ever needed any sort of advice. So I went to the house, and when the door opened up at the Winkler house, I shyly held up my Oscar like this. <laughs> and you should have seen Henry and his wife's faces. They were beaming from ear to ear. And then Henry's expression changed, and it was as if he already known, knew about the negative reviews and the predictions about my career. And then Henry looked me straight in the eye, and he echoed the same words as he said nine years earlier. Marley, you can be whatever you want to be, but this time you're not finished yet. Not by a long shot. You have an Oscar in your hand to prove it. So, why don't you stay for the weekend and we're going to think it over. Two years later, um, Henry was telling me to clean up my room. <laughs> <laughs> I never left for that weekend. I never did. Because Stacy made the best brisket west of Chicago when the rent was free. <laughs> but seriously, the point is, is that while I was living at the Winkler house, Henry and his wife constantly reinforced the idea that anything is possible and that change had to start with me. So rather than wait for things to happen, rather than hope that offers would come in, I made things happen for myself. I got proactive and I met with film executives. I formed my own production company. And I was determined 
to come up with creative solutions in order to get out from people's preconceived notions about what an actor who is deaf could or couldn't do. So now, it's mm -hmm. been 24 years since Hollywood critics declared my career DOA, deaf on arrival, <laughs> and I'm still here! <laughs> I've done movies, and I've done television. And just this past spring, as you heard, I defied expectations of a cowboy who proclaimed himself the king of Nashville and was reinforced by none other than Meatloaf when it came to raising money when I raised a million dollars in one day for my charity, the Starkey Hearing Foundation. Yeah. How's that for never working again in Hollywood, right?